good day, good morning, good afternoon, maybe good evening. Um, we are joining you here from the UN Pension Fund in New York and Geneva, um, also from Nairobi. And we are the team of the client services in the UN Pension Fund uh, giving you today um, essential information that we deem essential for retirees and beneficiaries of the UN Pension Fund. Thank you very much for joining. This is the first session that we do, do in this global format for our retirees and beneficiaries worldwide. If you're here with your spouse and or family members, we welcome everyone and we are grateful for you to take this time um, to learn, or maybe you know already um, about your status while in retirement or while in receipt of a benefit from the fund whether that is a disability benefit or a survivor's benefit, or of course, a form of retirement benefit. Um, we have started organizing these sessions this year because we want to make sure that we provide information regularly and we connect with you all in this manner. It is of course not as, as perfect and nice as it would be if we could be in a room together and in person. However, at least we hope that this will give you some access to the fund. And with this, I also introduce all the team members from the client services team in New York, in Geneva, in Bangkok and in Nairobi, who are all here to help answer your questions. It's not the full team of everyone, but um, we are a large team of people so that if you have questions that you would like to ask in the Q&A chat window that you may see up in your screen, it says Q&A, um, that team is available and will do its best to answer your questions. I will say that um, number one, please don't ask questions about personal cases because we do not want you to share um, your credentials, your unique ID number and name together. That is never a good idea, as you probably know, because we want to keep that safe and secure. Um, so questions should be if you have any of general nature. And ideally, if they could be connected to what I am talking about, that would be best because we will go over a number of topics today. And um, hopefully the questions you have are actually answered when we're going through the slides and the chapters about those topics. Um, let me, sorry, I don't know whether my screen moves. Try again. First of all, this is kind of what we imagine uh, based on the many retirees that we had the great pleasure of meeting and beneficiaries. We see that, especially for retirement, that we have a lot of our colleagues when they separate, some of them are a little bit anxious because they don't know what lays ahead. Some are very, very happy and look forward to what comes in the next chapter of being a little bit more free with your time, how you organize it. But overall, this is just kind of like a thought cloud of what we often see when we interact with our retirees and beneficiaries is that there is a different kind of fulfillment and um, freedom maybe in retirement. So ideally, we hope that the pension fund can contribute to you enjoying a happy and healthy retirement, and that you have, of course, an income that is stable, you receive it every month, and for survivors that you are covered um, in the event of the death of our retiree, or of course, of a death in service. So with that said, um, what are we going to talk about today? We are going to cover these topics, and some of these chapters include subtopics that also might be of relevance to you. And by the way, shout out to all those who prepared this presentation because it's a joint effort that we do here in the fund. Um, so we're going to talk about first a little bit about the fund. So just that you have an update on what your pension fund is up to in terms of activities, but also, of course, um, what our membership looks like these days, funding status. And then we go on and look at more uh, practical matters, let's say. We will talk about the website and I will take you on a bit of a journey on where on the website you can find information that is useful for you while in retirement or in receipt of survivor's benefits or a disability benefit. And we will talk about member self-service specifically for you 
who are in receipt of regular monthly payments. Your member self-service, if you have used it, you know, looks different than it looked when you were a participant in the fund. Um, so we'll just highlight the, the, the tabs in member self-service that we think are especially useful for you while in retirement and how they can serve you. We will then move on to uh, death-related matters and survivor's benefits. We receive a lot of questions from our retirees and even from our participants while in service um, who want to be sure that they prepare and set everything up the best way they can for their potential survivors. So we want to give you a bit of an overview of where you can find important information on the website and how you could possibly prepare to put that in to the side somewhere with your will, maybe where you have your papers, so that when the time comes and if the time comes that a survivor needs to look and inform the pension fund of the death of a pension fund member, that they know what to do, whom to contact, and also have an idea of what the process is um, to for the fund to implement survivor's benefits. Then we will look at the certificate of entitlement exercise. As you all probably know, you have to submit every year a proof of life to the fund so that we can be sure that we have to continue paying you your regular monthly payments. That's a, it is an important exercise also to ensure the financial security of the fund so that we don't pay benefits to someone who's no longer entitled or has passed away. We will go a little bit into the digital certificate of entitlement, which is, um, as some or maybe all of you know, a new way and an option for um, retirees and beneficiaries to provide their proof of life in the form of a biometric picture in a digital certificate of entitlement mobile app. So we just want to clarify a little bit more about this DCE, Digital Certificate of Entitlement mobile app, um, so that you feel more informed, you have a better idea if you haven't used it yet, what that is and whether you want to try and use it. We advertise this DCE very much because we think it's actually really user-friendly once you have successfully set up um, the DCE app and you could then year after year issue your biometric picture and submit your proof of life to the fund in a manner that doesn't involve any paper. So we'll talk about those two aspects of the certificate of entitlement. We will also, of course, talk about how you can submit your CE, your certificate of entitlement, if you do not want to or you cannot use the digital CE app. Then we look at some practical aspects of change of address or changing your payment instructions, your banking details, and how to do that. And we talk briefly about cost of living adjustment, uh, just the concept of how does a fund adjust for cost of living over time? How does it adjust your benefits? What can you expect? And finally, we'll have a look at the UN Pension Fund Emergency Fund, which is a fund that in cases of financial hardship may be able to make one-time um, exceptional payments from that emergency fund. Specific conditions apply, so we just want to highlight that this fund exists and for you to have an idea of um, what the conditions are and where you can find, of course, more information. And then in the end, of course, we are going to have a look at how you can best contact us. So these are the topics we're going to cover today. Um, again, thank you for being here. It is going to take about two hours from now um, to go over these topics. And I can only thank you for taking the time to attend the session. Just so you know, the recording of this session and the PowerPoint presentation will be shared on our website um, under, uh, I will show you where, under the web, start, web page where we advertise these regular monthly pension town halls, where you can then access both the recording and this document in the future at any point. And finally, we have the same session as this one today in French next month on the 12th of June. 
Um, so that's it. And we shall go in and start talking about a bit more about the fund. So at this point today in 2023, the fund is serving over 236,000 members worldwide. Um, you may be aware that we serve 24 member organizations. We had 25 organizations last year, but this year that one organization, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, closed and we are now down to 24 member organizations with 149,000, a little bit more, actually closer to 150,000 active participants, staff members who are paying contributions to the fund. And that is an increase of over 4% from 2022 in the number of participants. And we have over 86,000 recipients of periodic benefits, meaning of retirement, survivors and disability benefits. So over 86,000 members in the fund receiving benefits at this time from the fund. 17% of those benefits are paid under the so-called two-track system. So for those of you who are on the two-track, you know very well what that means. Um, that is a decline. We had a larger number in the past, but we see that currently less members are joining the two-track system because it is less beneficial than it was in the past. At this point, just to clarify that we are not today talking about the two-track. Why? Because we have an entire session dedicated to the two-track that took place actually um, during the months of April and May, one in French, one in English. And those two track uh, virtual town halls were, were recorded and are available on our website. So if you're interested in the two track, then please visit our website where you can access the recording and the um, documents relating to the presentation um, for the two track presentation. So in terms of funding, the fund, um, the UN Pension Fund, as of 3rd, 17 May this year, had um, a value of over 91 billion US dollar. That is an increase from the same time last year of several billion. That is the current funding status. Um, I do not yet have the official numbers for the contributions received and the benefits paid in 2023. So I'm sharing here the numbers for 2022. We do expect that the numbers are slightly higher in 2023, but they have not yet been officially communicated. The year end exercise is just closing or just closed. So in 2022, the fund received contributions in the amount of just over 3.12 billion US dollar. And the fund had to make, make payments in the amount of just over 3.13 billion US dollar. So there was a slight, slight deficit, um, which of course was um, filled by using a tiny bit of the money from the market value of the fund. Overall, the fund is in a very healthy situation, well-funded and well on track to pay benefits for the long term into the future to all those who are entitled, not only you who are currently entitled, but also those, of course, who are currently members of the fund and who will expect to receive some form of payout from the fund in the future. For um, investment information, please visit our website because we in Pension Administration, where our client services team is um, working. We are not investment experts. We are informed, but we are not the right people to give you information on the investments of the fund. So for that, I would very much invite you to please visit the investment pages of the website where you can find more detailed information than what you see here. In terms of where, where we pay benefits, um, I don't know from where, where you are joining us today. We pay benefits nearly in every country in the world. Um, I think currently we're paying in probably 190 plus countries. You can see the distribution of where we pay most here. You can see that there's definitely a, a big, big number, the biggest number of payments being made in the United States. 
um, followed by countries. Um, Canada is a big country, Europe, of course, and then, of course, all over the world. Here, an overview of where we pay benefits, just to give you an idea. I think this is an interesting slide, too. It's um, showing you a little bit the aging of the UN pension fund um, population, specifically retirees and beneficiaries. And the news is that the life expectancy of the funds, uh, retirees and be beneficiary population is constantly increasing. So here's a comparison between 2000, year 2000 and the year 2023. And you can see the increase in life expectancy over time. Also, of course, the number of benefits that we pay. This is more about the aging trend in terms of what are the numbers of benefits we pay to related to the age group of people. But I can tell you also that um, as per actual evaluations that the fund does every two years, the life expectancy of the fund population is increasing over time. And it is currently somewhere around year um, age 88, 89, I think, for retirees that are male, the men, and over 90, I think it's actually 91 years of age for women. But here what you see is in terms of benefits that we pay. So, of course, the benefit in total, the number of benefits we pay has increased since the year 2000. But the proportion of the um, in which age group we pay has definitely shifted. And we at this time pay the largest number of benefits to those who are in the age group between the ages 70 to 79. Over 25,000 benefits are paid to that age group and then followed by those in the age group um, 60 to 69, over 23,000 benefits and followed by those age group 80 to 89, over 15,000. And if you compare that to the numbers at which we paid in 2000, you see the increase in benefits the fund pays, but also the proportions. And then finally, we have an eightfold increase in the age group of those that are 90 and older. So you see that currently we pay over 4,000 benefits to those who are 90 years or older. So definitely the fund is aware and sees and knows that we have to expect to pay benefits for a longer and longer period in time after separation into um, retirement. And that includes, of course, survivors. Otherwise, what is going on in the fund? The fund has processed benefits um, for new beneficiaries and for survivors, um, and it has outperformed its benchmark of implementing benefits within 15 business days from receipt of all required documents for a case of a new beneficiary um, with over 92 benefits implemented within that time frame. Um, in terms of modernization, the fund is proud that the digital certificate of entitlement that had some, I would say, growing pains at the beginning, um, where the, the app was not as performing as it is now, and it has been improved tremendously over time. Um, the digital certificate of entitlement app is now being used by more than 30,000 beneficiaries of the fund out of more than 80,000 who have to provide their proof of life. So the fund is aiming at increasing that number by doing very active outreach about the digital certificate of entitlement and by dedicating resources to supporting any technical or other issues with the digital CE so that you get the help you need when you need it, either for enrollment or for any issues you may encounter with the digital CE. But this CE by those that are using it and who have used it more than once, I would say, is found to be truly user friendly and useful. We also know that some people don't like it and that is absolutely fine. Of course, if there are issues with issuing your photo and it's just painful to use, we understand that. And in that case, there is always the option of using the paper based CE form. 
In terms of pension payments, um, the monthly payroll has continued and has been issued without interruption since the fund's inception, basically. So it's been issued on time. Unfortunately, we know that sometimes people do not receive their benefits because of some disruptions in uh, global payment channels. That has happened, of course, in some countries like Russia, Ukraine, um, some countries in uh, Sudan. But generally, in terms of payroll, the fund has made regular payments on the payroll without any disruption um, since its inception. In terms of COLA, there was a COLA for 2024, an increase of 3.4% of the benefits paid under the US dollar track um, that has been applied since the 1st of April this year. And of course, there have been adjustments also um, to the two track payments that the fund makes. The fund's care strategy. Maybe you have heard about this. This is basically what is guiding us in our strategy in terms of how the fund functions, how we look into uh, modernizing the fund, etc. And this care strategy that we had already for the years 21 to 23 under the current uh, SEPA, the current um, executive of pension administration, Rosemary McLean, has been extended and adjusted for the years 24 um, and basically up to years 30, 2030. And it is based on the pillars of being client focused, action oriented, relationship builder and efficiency driven. And that means that we have three pillars which indicate or guide us in where we focus our attention in terms of where we want to modernize, innovate and pay special attention in improving the services that the fund provides to its membership and all stakeholders. We are focusing on simplifying the client experience and hope that we will be successful in making it easier for you to interact with the fund, to receive information when you need it, to receive um, services from the fund when you need it. And that, um, of course, usually is we're trying to do that without increasing the resources of the fund in as much as we can. Um, we you want to use and leverage technology. We are also aware that technology is not always the answer to everything. And that is always on the mind of pension administration to keep in mind that given our membership and the fact that you are worldwide and with different kinds of access to technology and of course, depending on your age and on your health situation, more or less comfortable accessing certain forms of technology. The fund is aware and will continue to ensure that we serve everyone, not just those who can use all forms of modern technology. The fund is also looking into strengthening partnerships with member organizations, with affix organizations, retiree associations, and um, to modernize services. Aligned with this strategy are two main projects that will impact you, retirees and beneficiaries. And I just want to highlight them here so that you have them on your mind, even if we are not yet at a stage where we have implemented them, them, but so that you are aware that they are in the works and that in the near future, you may hear about them and the fact that they will start to be implemented and used. And in that case, you will experience them. One is a new system that is a customer relationship or client management and relationship system, a new platform that we are building where we want to integrate our system of query handling fully with our core system of pension administration so that there are there is more interactivity possible more um, proactiveness possible for the fund to contact you, to reach out to you, to provide you services, but also hopefully to automate certain services in the fund so that we can focus our team members on working on services that cannot be automated and where we then can respond to you faster and provide services faster. So that system is going to be called or is called UNJ SPF Connect. And in the future, when we implement it, you will see that because when you will contact us via the official channels that you can access on our website, 
you will see that you will have an option to connect to us via member self-service. That is not going to happen in the next couple of months, but we aim at that being the case early as of late this or early next year. So when you hear UNJSPF Connect, that is a system that hopefully will make it easier to interact with the fund and provide you services faster. The other system that we will have to implement is a multi-factor authentication to access the UNJSPF member self-service. Why multi-factor authentication? To secure your data and your access to member self-service and ensure that you are the one who is accessing it and not someone else that you don't want to access it. In other words, multi-factor authentication is going to be used in order to make the funds member self-service safer and more secure. Not to say that it is not safe and secure, but the fund is aware of increasing um, malvolent activities worldwide with regard to um, system breaches and hacking and so on. And I'm sure you're aware of that too. Spam, but worse than that, phishing attempts and so on. So all of that, the fund is aware and wants to make sure that your access to the fund systems is as secure as it can be. And that will involve that you will have to provide two ways of um, identification before you can get into the system. And this is something that you may already be used to when you access your bank online or maybe your health care provider online. So systems that have data that relates to your case usually try to protect that data and will now make these multi-factor authentication or MFA requirements part of accessing systems. Again, this is not yet in place, but the fund is very strongly working on implementing multi-factor authentication. Of course, we will communicate to you all once we are ready to implement multi-factor authentication as well as UNJSPF Connect. Some benefits of UNJSPF Connect, I'm listing them here, but truly you can have access to this presentation once you um, it is posted on our webpage. You can go into the details. I don't want to bore you at this point with these kind of information about something that is not that yet in place, but the purpose here is just to say that the system, the client relationship management system that we are working on will improve services to clients, you, the members of the fund. It will also hopefully, and that's certainly the intention, make the work for the staff in the fund better um, with having easier access to data and so on so that they can work more efficiently in our systems and um, provide services that much um, if more efficiently and faster. And then it, ultimately for the fund, it is going to be also an improvement because it will allow us to connect teams better internally, automate certain testing tools and so on. So it's overall to increase efficiency and simplify and modernize the client experience um, in the, with the fund. And I already mentioned the benefits of multi-factor authentication, increase, increased security, reduced risk, better control over sensitive data. There's a variety of authentication choices. You will see phone, email, um, text, and it conforms to best practices in the industry. And finally, the fund has worked a lot to improve access to information about the fund. These pension town halls today are part of that initiative to ensure that you get access to us in this format at least. Um, we continue, we will continue holding them at least one session per month, either in English or in French. Plus in the future, we will also organize shorter sessions where we will just talk about one single topic and have more of a moderated um, session where we address that specific topic. That is going to happen either later this year or as of early next year. 
Um, the communications team in the fund is working very heavily with all members in the fund to provide you with more videos to help simplify information, more web news and the newsletters that you get hopefully um, months after months with key information about what the fund is doing and that might be relevant to you. The annual letter was distributed in April, so you probably saw that. And we have new booklets, um, informational booklets that have been updated or not new, but updated. And finally, we have a new social media channel. If you're using WhatsApp, please subscribe to the UNJSPF social media channel where you can get quick information that might be again relevant to you. Now, in terms of website, Allow me to pull in the website so that I can take you on a bit of a little tour on our website. Sorry, my mouse is slow, but it is coming. So I'm pulling over the funds website and here we are on our website. You might be very familiar with the website, so I'm sorry if this is something you all know already, but I just want to highlight a couple of points. First of all, we have key information, as you can see, that is sliding over, whether it is to just give you general information or highlight some activity that is happening. Um, the fund, by the way, celebrated its 75th birthday last year. Um, there are information about pension town hall sessions. So when you visit the website, this is where you will see some key information sliding through. Then if you scroll down, you have these chapters, participating, separating or retiring, retired or receiving benefits. And under each of these set chapters, we have compiled key information, the key web pages, that might be of relevance for you because you are in that uh, category of members of the fund that are currently retired or receiving benefits. So that's an easy way of accessing key web pages for your case, going to the chapter that corresponds to your status with the fund. If you scroll on further, you have key figures about the fund, the 88.8 .8 billion US dollar funding of the uh, market value of the fund is the date um, was at the 30th of April. We are now already at a higher level. I gave you a little bit earlier the funding on 17 May, which you saw was over 90 billion. Then you see down here news and announcements. This is where we publish the latest news articles. If you want more news, you click on more news and you see the older news articles and then Scrolling and scrolling, you get more information. Now, generally to access the important web pages where we really try to keep you up to date on key information about topics that are relevant for you, you can either click on for clients and then you would see all the web pages that the fund has about specific topics. So that's one way of doing it. Or you could click, as I said earlier, on retired or receiving benefits, or if you're a survivor, click on survivor, and then it would open only the web pages or only, sorry, not open, it would take you to a page where we compiled only the most relevant web pages for that category of members of the fund. So it's up to you, whatever you deem might be useful. And if you look at the web pages, there is information about after have service health insurance, basically to tell you that this is not administered by the fund. Yes, if you instructed your ASHI provider to take money out of your monthly pension, then the fund will do that at the request from ASHI. But that's it. We don't have insight into your health insurance premium payments, etc. So anything relating to health insurance, the fund is not aware. Um, however, we do know that sometimes your benefit every month fluctuates because the ASHI premium fluctuates. And then in that case, again, all we could tell you if you come to us saying, why is my benefit lower or maybe higher? Um, all we could tell you is to say it's probably ASHI related because we can see that the premium last month was a bit lower than it is this month. But why the premium for ASHI changed, the fund would never know.
So ideally, you should check in your member self-service what the reason might be for a benefit fluctuation. Um, and if you see it has to do with a premium for ASHI, go to your health insurance provider. So then we have a tab about authentication of signatures and documents. Here we explain under what circumstances we actually need your signature to be authenticated. And if so, what is proper signature authentication? Who is entitled to authenticate your signature and accept it by the fund as an authenticating official? So all of that is actually explained on this web page. Then we have the page on the Certificate of Entitlement, where we keep you up to date on what is going on for the current year Certificate of Entitlement activities, plus any pre-suspension activities. So another page that is important to keep an eye on, because there you will see when do we dispatch the Certificate of Entitlement forms, when do we start doing the pre-suspension exercise for those who didn't return a Certificate of Entitlement, and so on, and just generally Q&A and um, information about this. There's information about child's benefit, cost of living adjustment, deaths, how to notify the fund of the deaths of a UN pension fund member. We have a whole web page on the digital certificate of entitlement, a page on divorce, the emergency fund of the UNJSPF, information on what could be the reason for fluctuation of monthly benefit payments, more general information, a whole web page on legal guardianship and estates, also very important. Here we explain at what point the fund would require legal guardianship, and if so, what kind of legal guardian does the fund recognize? The fund does not recognize power of attorney or enduring power of attorney, we only recognize a court-appointed legal guardian when a beneficiary of the fund, a retiree or beneficiary, is no longer able to exercise their own administrative activities when they are, for reasons of health, no longer able to handle their own affairs. It has to be a court-appointed legal guardian in order for the fund to take action based on legal guardian instructions. Why? because the fund wants to protect the retiree and beneficiary and ensure that it is only a person that has been authorized by a court or an according, uh, according um, official authority to take action on your behalf. There could be otherwise abuse of authority if someone who is not court appointed gets that um, power. We have information about what to do in the case of non-receipt of monthly payments. When that happens, what should you do? How to contact the fund with what information to ensure that we can assist you the fastest possible. We have information about power of attorney and the fact that we do not recognize it. Also information about re-employment of retirees. And finally, information about survivor's benefits. Very important, of course. Taxation of benefits, here we really just say that the fund does not provide advice on taxes. We cannot do that because we cannot keep abreast of tax legislation in over 190 countries where we pay benefits. Um, but there's a tax guide that might be of some use to some of you. And then we have information on the two-track system. Of course, information that is relevant for those who might inquire about the two-track if you're interested in it, um, or those who are on the two track, if you need to know what happens if I move country, etc. And then some information about updating your marital status. If you get married while in retirement or um, maybe get uh, divorced and or your spouse died. And finally, updating payment instruction and personal information other than marital status. So you see there's a whole bunch of tabs and web pages that we make that we created just to help you get information as fast as possible when you need it. And of course, all of this information exists in English and in French. If you click in the top left corner, you can go to the French version of each of the pages of the website. That is the for clients, um, let's say, menu item. 
Under investments, you can, of course, get information on the investments of the fund. Specifically, if you want to know the fund performance over time or how the fund invests, some information about actuarial matters for the fund, risk management. So there is a whole bunch of information that you may want to visit if you haven't done that yet. And under historical fund performance, you would see that the fund constantly updates this page to provide the latest status of funding. I know this is not very um, easy to read. You can make it bigger by clicking here and then you move around a little bit so you can see that the current value of the fund is over 91 billion US dollar. And then we have resources. And what is this? This is really about giving you more kind of tools um, to help you with navigating pension questions. Here you have the regulations and rules. You have information about your UN pension fund member self-service, reports, publications, of course, all the forms. But remember, all the pension forms are also inside your member self-service where they are actually pre-completed with your name and your unique ID number. If you use the forms from the website, they are not pre-completed. It's always better to use a form that you downloaded from your member self-service because then it has a barcode that contains your information, plus it is pre-completed with your unique ID number and your name. And that just ensures that um, we index it correctly when it reaches us and take action as quick as we can. So that's for forms. We have e-learning modules that anyone can take in their own time when they are interested. And those e-learning modules include one that is called in retirement. And that in retirement module contains information similar to what we're talking about today. Then the web page about the pension town hall sessions like the one today. This page is constantly updated with the next upcoming dates for new sessions, the topics, and um, generally what it will, the topic will be, um, what topics will be covered. Um, and of course, it will include information about past events with links to the recording and the presentation of that past event. So here is where we will post the recording of this session plus the um, presentation. So you can access that in the future here without any problem. Um, and then, as I said, we will post the link to connect to the next session on the 12th of June in French for in retirement um, once we're done with this session. So we only connect, we only provide one link at the time. So currently here's the link for today's session, but we will post the link for the 12th June session as soon as we get that link so that people on the 12th of June who want to attend the French session can easily do that. There's some FAQs about the sessions and that's basically it. So that is under resources and under pension town hall sessions. And then we have access to all the videos that the fund has produced. Um, there are many, many videos. Here you can see. And these videos are just a few minutes long and might really help you understand topics because they have illustration and of course they are also narrated. And all the videos exist in French, in English and in Spanish. So while Spanish is not an official language of the fund in the sense it's not a working language, and therefore we don't have the resources to, pro to provide town halls in Spanish or um, to provide generally communication in Spanish, we have made all these videos available in Spanish to help those whose language is Spanish um, understand these key topics for which we have videos. So I would encourage you to check out the topics for which we have videos and to watch the videos in the language of your preference. These videos are also linked on the related topic web pages. So if you go to the web page on survivor's benefits, you will find the video about survivor's benefits on that page. Or as I showed you, you have this page with all the videos. Then there's a page with informative booklets, also again about all the kinds of topics that we cover. And then we have all the exchange rates, consumer price index adjustment and cost of living factors in 
a special web page where you can check out um, these factors if you're on the two track uh, for the country where you reside. So if you reside in Austria, you can just simply select your country. And in that case, um, you will see once it loads that you can see the most recent exchange rates, the consumer price index adjustments for Austria, which was, by the way, 5.6% in April, and so on. So this is for those of you who are on the two track, you can find that information. And for the United States, of course, you can also find this information for those of you who are under the US dollar track, if you're interested to know the history of all of this data. So here you see, latest adjustment was 3.4% for the US dollar track. Anyone paid under the US dollar track, regardless of which currency you are paid in, if your benefit is adjusted based on the movements of the consumer price index of the United States, you received this 3.4% adjustment of your benefit, even if your benefit is paid in a currency different um, other than the US dollar. So this is also under resources. And then under resources, you have link to FAFIX, the Federation of the Associations of Former International Civil Servants. And this is a really useful resource because it gives you access to information about this Federation of Retiree Associations of retirees of the UN Pension Fund. And of course, survivors might also be part of these associations. Um, at the bottom of this page, if you scroll down under About Farfix, you have the first dot bullet where they explain that there are currently 34 member associations of Farfix all over the world. So 64 countries have a retiree association. Some retiree associations are more active than others. We know this. But if you are interested to see whether you would like to join a retiree association, which are very valued partners of the pension fund and a very important, um, how to say, advocate for retiree and beneficiary um, causes, I would say visit this member associations of FAFIX link. Voila, so I clicked on that and it took me to the page where Farfix provides all the contact details for each of the associations that exist currently in the 64 countries where they exist. So you could check whether in your country there is a retiree association. And if, for example, you are joining today from Costa Rica and you want to possibly uh, inform yourself about the retiree association in Costa Rica, you click here and it takes you to the contact details for that retiree association. Usually there are email addresses and telephone numbers, plus, um, yeah, I mean, I guess the key contact details where you could reach out and then get information about the retiree association. So that is just so you're aware that, sorry, on our website, you can access that information um, by going to, excuse me, resources and there the before last bullet or uh, topic um, sorry menu item is farfix that's where you can find that link now about us obviously is about the fund i'm not going to go through all of this but i will stop here at contact us it's a very important tab here we publicize all the contact channels of the un pension fund when you click here, it will take you to the UN Pension Fund Contact Us web page. On this web page, you can get information about how to correctly contact the fund and submit written queries. Here you can send us a message. So if you want to send us a message, you select retiree beneficiary. You tell us what you would like to get help with. Let's say with the annual certificate of entitlement. You click on this topic. You see that immediately it tells you you can find more information about this topic here, annual certificate of entitlement. If you click there, it will take you to that page. And immediately, maybe you read this page first because maybe it actually answers your question. Otherwise, if not, I have to go back, sorry. Then I lost my 
let me go back here, sorry. So then if you didn't get the information you need on that web page, you provide your unique ID number, whatever that may be. I'm doing a fake number here. Your title, in my case, it would be Ms. My name, Christine. And then my email, I'm just pretending, blah, blah, blah. Put your email is important because we will need it to contact you. Ideally, please use the email that you have recorded with the fund at some point, if you hopefully have your phone number. And here, please use the format plus. Oops, sorry. I don't know that happened. Plus to show that it's an international number, then wherever you are, your country code. In my case, it's one. And then your number, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, once you've done that, for retirees, can you please provide, and you have to provide, your country of residence? So let's say I reside in Albania. That doesn't connect with my phone number, but just as an example, you don't need to, met, to put your um, former employing organization that is not needed, and then you tell us what you need help with. Did you receive my CE form for 2023? Done. And then you submit your query. By the way, if you don't know whether we received your CE form, you can go into your member self-service where you can actually check whether we received it or not. Um, but let's say you sent us this message. Um, you just have to say, I'm not a robot. And then you submit it. OK, this is the correct way of sending messages to the fund. Why? Because these messages fall into buckets on the other side, depending on where you're writing for, from, it will be sent either to our Geneva or to our New York team. And then um, depending on the topic you're inquiring about, there will be specialists for the topic accessing that bucket. And it doesn't matter whether someone, you know, some members of our team are in or out, maybe on annual leave or sick leave or whatever, there are always people looking at every bucket into which we receive queries. In other words, this is a secure way of submitting your query, both for the data that you submit, but also in the sense that we will be able to receive it to ensure that someone is looking at it in the best delays and replies to you with the relevant and um, correct answer. OK, so that's how you submit your written queries. Please do not write to individual members of the fund. If they are out for an extended period or on mission or something, they may not see your message. However, if you submit it here as indicated, then it doesn't matter who is in or out because there's always a team, a core team working on the entirety of queries we receive. Now, if you say, I actually don't want to write, I want to call, then we have our call center or contact center. And um, depending on whether you are more aligned with New York hours or more aligned with Geneva hours, you can choose whichever number you want to call. It will reach the same contact center, which functions 24 hours, five days a week. So our contact center provides services for um, 24 hours every day, Monday to Friday. We also have over 65 toll free numbers. If you're calling from any of the countries listed here, use the toll free number so you are not paying for the call. OK, and then under New York and Geneva, for those of you who might be in New York or Geneva or visit at some point, in that case, if you wanted to visit us in person, we have walk in services in New York and in Geneva and the hours for walk in services are advertised here. In New York, it is Tuesdays and Thursdays, 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. every week. And in Geneva, the visiting time is um, also Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. every Tuesday and Thursday, local time, of course. Keep a look before you visit. Always check the website to make sure we are not exceptionally closed. We are not often closed. But if there's a snowstorm or I don't know, during the pandemic, for example, we had to close offices and we had a few people come and visit the offices and they were closed to clients. We were still working, but we weren't allowed to receive clients. 
Um, and in that case, of course, it's better if you check beforehand so that you're not coming to the office and there's no one to assist you. Um, so just make sure you always check quickly on the website to make sure you are aware of the official walk-in service hours and days and then just any special announcement. And finally, on our website, and that concludes our tour of the website, we have the urgent assistance menu. Urgent assistance is for two main topics. One, to report that your regular monthly benefit payment stopped for some reason, and to request for urgent assistance from the fund and help to reinstate the payments. And the other topic is to report the deaths of a UN pension fund member to the fund. So if one of these topics are the reason for contacting the fund, it is helpful to first look at the urgent assistance page, which is the only page that exists in English, French, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, and Arabic, the six official languages um, of the United Nations. So you click on urgent assistance in the language of your choice, and there you will have number one information about non-receipt by a retiree or beneficiary of their regular monthly payments, basically when your payments stopped. We explain what you should do, what you should submit to the fund and how to best contact us. There's a special mailbox so that we can take action as a priority for your case. A payment stopped case or a death notification are the most important cases for the fund and we will always get to those first. So we give them priority over any other query that we receive. And under number two, we have information about death of a retiree or beneficiary and how to notify the fund, what information we need and where to write and how to contact us. And again, there is a special mailbox that we advertise here where people can write directly if they don't want to use the contact form. So that is it for the website. I hope this gives you a good idea of how we built the website, but also what information we have here. And really, the entirety of the website was designed with you and our participants in mind to find ways of making it easy to find information. Is it perfect? Probably not. Are we working still on improving everything? Yes, always. We are trying to improve the language. We are trying to improve with providing more resource material, more um, documents that we provide on topic pages, tutorials, videos. Um, we are creating one pages for survivors. We are creating one pages for new participants. So there's always work going on and our communications team is very, very active. It's a very small team, but they have created a lot of content to ensure that you and participants get as much information in a format that is easy to absorb and easy to find um, when you need it. And in the future, we will hopefully also have more interactive features that allow you to find information even faster. All right. That's it for the website, um, and that brings me to member self-service, the next topic. Member self-service is a very important tool that everyone who is a member of the fund should use. In order to register for member self-service, you can, first of all, visit resources about member self-service. Here, you get general information about member self-service, including what each tab under Member of Service is for. What is the disbursement tab for? Very important tab. It's basically your payslip months after months. What is the document tab for? Again, very important tab because this is where you find your official benefit letter, um, your CE form, et cetera, et cetera. E forms, important tab because this is where you will get access to all the official forms of the UN Pension Fund pre-completed with your name and your unique ID number and a barcode that helps us index it to your file as fast as possible. The proof documents tab, very important. This is where you can track whether the fund received your annual certificate of entitlement form, not the digital certificate of entitlement. That is different. But if you submitted your form either via member self-service 
or you send your CE form to us by mail, once we have recorded it in our system, it will be visible in your proof document tab. And finally, there is the emergency fund tab where if you have an emergency fund request, you could submit it. And there is a two track tab, which I don't see, but it should be here. Sorry, estimates, that's where it is, I'm sorry. So there is um, there are estimates that includes a two track estimate um, for you retirees and beneficiaries if you're interested. And finally, very important tab, MSS document upload. Here is where you can upload documents like a form that you printed, dated and hand signed and then made a scanned copy of a PDF or a JPEG or something. And then you can upload it in member self service back to the fund. In that case, you don't need to send us the hard copy by mail. So the document upload tab is very important. The same goes for the CE form. You can upload a hand signed and dated CE form in its scanned version back to the fund using this tab. You don't need to use mail. OK, so here on the website, we explain to you what member self service is about, how it can serve you. Um, and of course, practical information on how to register. So there are guides. There's a member self service video. There is explanation on how to set up your account, how to recover your password, etc. There are tutorials, documents, step by step guides, how to set up, how to register, etc. Again, in the three languages, English, French and Spanish. And if you are registering and you don't remember your unique ID number, then there is information on how you can obtain your unique ID number by simply writing to this email address. So information about member self service on this web page. Once you have registered and you have created your password and your username and you have given, of course, associated your personal email account with your member self service, then in the future you can simply click in this tab here on the website. So if you go to the website, immediately you have member self service login to get quickly to member self service and then you click on login and there you go. If you can't remember either your password or your username at the time of wanting to join member self service. Just go to forgot username or forget forgot password. It will help you reset your password or username. And of course, if ever. Sorry, I'm looking for about. Yeah, if ever um, you need help because you just can't reset your password or username. In that case, you can reach out to the fund by writing to MSS support at unjspf.org and request for help. The MSS support team is active 24 hours, five, time, five days a week, and they respond usually within the same day or if not by the next day. So if you need help, reach out to them. That's what they are there for. Now, let me go back to the presentation. I'm going to skip the next pages and we are here now in member self service. So member self service. Um, as mentioned here is useful to you on a daily basis or not a daily, but a regular basis to access your certificate of entitlement. If you're not on the two track, you can access the form under the documents tab to submit your certificate of entitlement to the fund or any other document you want to submit via the MSS document upload tab. To track receipt of your certificate of entitlement under the proof document tab. To submit other like an emergency fund request to print your official pension forms and other activities. I already showed you this is what member self service looks like for a retiree or beneficiary. Um, these are the tabs that would be available to you and I already mentioned um, most of them. I will say that disbursement is one of the most important because this is where you can track months after months every payment ever made to you by the fund. It will include deduction for after service health insurance premium if that is a case for your case. So you would even be able to see how much was taken out for a given months from your pension um, for health insurance purposes. 
So again, if you see a fluctuation in the benefit amount, always check whether it could be because the health insurance premium changed. And if that was the case, then of course, contact your health insurance if you need more information. But the disbursement tab is basically, as I said, your salary slip. If you needed to change the email address associated with your account, um, then you would go in the top right corner of your, excuse me, of your member of your member self-service where you see last logon and then next to it account. You click on account and under account, you would have the options to change your email address, to change your password. So remember that if you needed to change your email address for some reason, go up into your member self-service account top right corner to make the changes that you want to make. So I already mentioned what each of the tabs in your member self-service is about. Um, I will highlight the address tab. Here you can change your address provided you're not on the two track. If you're not on the two track and you want to change your address, you can do that in member self-service. Simply log into member self-service, click on address, and then go through the steps to update your address. It's, I think, pretty intuitive, um, but again, it's only available for those who are not paid under the two track. If you are on the two track, you have to reach out to the fund and submit form PF23M to change your address. You can upload that form once you have completed, dated, and hand signed it, inside member self-service, member self-service document upload. But you cannot do the actual change of address immediately in member self-service if you are paid under the two track. I will also stop a bit more on documents. Documents includes information like your official benefit letter if you separate it since 2015. That benefit letter contains all the information about your benefits since when you're entitled, um, what the amount of your own contributions was to the fund and uh, potential additional payments for children um, that you receive together with your benefit. So if you need that letter and you separate it since August 2015, it is in your member self-service probably. Of course, if it is not there, contact the fund and we will give it to you. Documents will also contain your quarterly COLA statement your statement of benefits for tax purposes. If you had requested that in the past, then it will be posted every year, um, probably early in the year for those who are on the tax year um, January, uh, who, who need a tax statement for January to December of a given year um, in your member self-service. And then if you generate a two-track estimate, the estimate itself will be shown under the document tab. And then again, the certificate of entitlement form will be posted under documents if you are on the US dollar track. If you are paid under the two track, you cannot access your MSS CE form in MSS. It's not available. But everyone can submit their documents back to the fund using the MSS document upload feature, which is part of the items, the menu items you have in member self-service as mentioned here under the third bullet. All right, so again, you have this presentation available on our website within the next couple of days. If you need go, to go back and read this in more detail, or you can go to the website under the About Member Self-Service menu item, and you can read about each of the tabs to understand better how they can serve you. The following pages illustrate um, how to change an address, how to read the disbursement page of member self-service, how to what the documents tab looks like and what documents you may want to find there. And then the proof document tab, which shows you whether we received your certificate of entitlement for a given year, um, how to read that. By the way, under the proof documents tab for the certificate of entitlement, it gives you the receive date of the document by the fund. It then says accepted date. Ignore the accepted date. That is part of what our system has as, an, as a field, but it's actually not required. We don't need to accept your CE. We do a signature verification, but even if you don't see the accepted date, 
it's good enough that we received your CE to not suspend your benefit. If there's an issue with your CE form, we will reach out to you. But don't worry if there's no accepted date populated with a date. That has no meaning. The only date that is important here is the received date. And then how to submit an emergency fund request in member self-service. Okay, so once again, the about member self-service page on our website will give you more information if you need it. We are now going to look into death related matters and survivors benefits. Um, so you have videos, watch the videos. There's a video about survivors benefits that explains the different kinds of survivors benefits the fund pays, whether that is a surviving spouse's benefit, surviving divorced spouse's benefit under very specific circumstances, surviving child's benefits, etc. And then there's a video to explain um, what would be relevant if you are a survivor of a pension fund retiree or beneficiary. Basically, it explains what you should do in case you need to report the death of a beneficiary or retiree to the UN pension fund. So these two videos, I would suggest that you watch them just so you have the information and you are aware of whatever is conveyed in the video. Now, what do you need to do if you need to inform the fund of the death of a UNJSPF member? Send an email to this specific mailbox, UNJSPF hyphen death related at un.org. Or of course, you can use the contact form. Both ways work. And in both cases, your, um, your case, because it is indicated as death related, will be given priority. You can also call the fund. If you don't want to write, call the fund. That works too. And you need to provide key information. The name of the deceased, the date of birth of the deceased, the date of death of the deceased, ideally their unique ID number or pension fund number, and their official mailing address, and if possible, also contact details for the surviving family. So sometimes we do have former colleagues or friends who report the death and they don't necessarily know all the details. As many details as possible will help us ensure that we are able to stop payments and take appropriate action. But the more details out of those that I just showed you, the more details you have, the better, because it will allow the fund to act faster. The most important piece then for the fund to receive as a next step is the death certificate. We must receive a death certificate, excuse me. <coughs> Apologies. In order to ensure that we, you know, have proof that someone actually died. We have a very rare cases where a bank has informed us that someone passed away and it actually wasn't true. It happens very, very rarely, but it can happen. So we don't want to stop someone's payment um, for the reason of passed away. And actually, of course, that didn't happen. That would be horrible. So we need a death certificate to confirm the death. And only if we have a death certificate can we move on to the next step, which is to then determine who might be entitled to survivor's benefits. The fund will have to determine that first, and we look at our records and all the information that was reported to us during the retiree's lifetime and why they were a member in the UN Pension Fund. And then based on that information, we normally know whether they are potential survivors, children, and or spouse, and or ex-spouse. So as the case may be, we then determine if there's an entitlement to survivor's benefit. And if that is the case, we will reach out to the survivor. Hopefully we have the contact details. If not, we make every effort to get them. And then we will request a copy of marriage certificate, the spouse's birth certificate, proof of ID, ideally a passport or some other valid government issued photo ID with a signature from the spouse or the whichever survivor, if it's not a child, and then um, we need them to complete a form called PENS E number two. And that form needs to be completed by the entitled survivor once the fund has confirmed that someone is entitled.
Okay, so these are the documents and that's the process that happens. We receive the notification of someone who died, for someone who died. The fund will stop the payments of that person and determine eligibility to survivor's benefits. If there are potentially overpayments because three months or so elapsed between the date of death and the date of informing the fund, the fund will first have to recover the overpayments before we can make payments to a potential survivor in the future. So, but in any case, the fund will receive the death notification, stop the payments, determine eligibility to potential survivor's benefits, reach out to the survivors, request the supporting evidence documents, and the new payment instruction form, PENS E2, from the survivor, the entitled survivor or survivors. And once we have received these documents, proceed to implement the benefit for the survivors or the benefits for the survivors. But the starting point for all of this is we need to absolutely get a death certificate. OK, so it can be the copy, certified copy of a death certificate or the original, but we must get a death certificate. This is what the form looks like that the survivor would have to complete. They have to select what kind of survivor they are, whether they are a widow or widower, or they are um, a divorced surviving spouse or a spouse married after separation while in retirement, or their children or even secondary dependents, or in some cases, recipients of a so-called residual settlement. Um, the form must be completed, dated, and hand signed, and the signature of the um, entitled survivor must be authenticated by uh, an official who is entitled to authenticate documents. And here on this page, we are linking to the web page on our website that is very clear on what are, who is entitled to authenticate documents. Normally it's either a UN official or a um, notary public or a government official, or in some cases, it could even be a, um, treating physician, a doctor, in which case we also need a medical certificate to indicate that there is a medical connection um, with that doctor. But normally it should be a UN official or a government official or a um, notary public. And the person authenticating the survivor's signature will have to provide their full name, official title, hand sign the document, date the document in the box that is for the authentication and provide their official stamp or seal of office. All of that inside the field provided on the page two of form PENS E7. There's a bit more information here on who can witness or authenticate a signature. So for more information, you have the information here in the presentation. Processing time. Um, of such benefits. So, first of all, who is actually entitled to survivor's benefit? If we're talking about spouses, if you were married at the time of separation at the latest, so you're married while you are a participant, and you remain married to the same spouse until the date of your death, then that spouse is entitled to surviving spouse's benefit, um, except if you were entitled and had elected a deferred retirement benefit with a partial lump sum. It's a very specific case and very few people have elected that kind of benefit. But if you are someone who elected um, before 2001 or before April 2001, a deferred retirement benefit with a partial lump sum, then your spouse is not entitled. Otherwise, the spouse would be entitled. And your spouse is also not entitled if you marry after separation and you did not purchase an annuity for that spouse married after separation from the fund. I would say in most cases, spouses that you were married to at the time of separation from service and that remain married to you until your date of death are entitled. There's no doubt about it. How long will it take to implement this benefit? Usually it's officially 15 business days, three weeks from the date of receipt 
of the complete set of required documents, death certificate, ID documents, marriage certificate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, form. Um, it can take up to four to six weeks, um, but we are talking about from the date of receipt from the full set of required documents. That's 15 business days normally. Unfortunately, there are sometimes issues. Sometimes we have spouses that we didn't know about that come and say, but why am I not entitled? Or we have several spouses claiming entitlement, or we have a unclarity regarding an ex-spouse that can delay um, processing. So I would say in the interest of your survivors, make sure you submit all the documents that you can possibly submit, including marriage certificates and divorce documents, to the fund while you are alive, so that when the time comes, the fund has all the documents it needs to determine who is entitled to what based on what documents. And of course, we only pay, doc pay benefits based on our regulations and rules and based on proof that a person is actually entitled. Once we have determined entitlement, we pay from the first day following the months during which the retiree died. So the benefit for the months during which the this retiree died, the retirement benefit is actually paid in full for that month. And then the surviving survivor's benefit, the surviving spouse's benefit kicks in as of the first day of the month following the death of the retiree. How much will a surviving spouse receive? If you did not take a lump sum as part of an early or a normal retirement benefit, then your spouse will receive 50% of what your full pension entitlement was at the time of death. So if you received $10,000 during that month as a retiree, your spouse would be entitled to $5,000 as a surviving spouse for life as a surviving spouse. However, if you took your maximum lump sum as part of an early or a normal retirement benefit, and you, the retiree, therefore reduced your own benefit accordingly for life, the fund will pay your spouse 50% of your full entitlement, the amount we would have paid had you not taken out your lump sum. So we would pay 50% of that amount, which usually means 75% of what you were receiving at the time of your death because you took out your lump sum. So. But generally speaking, a spouse receives 50% of the full, into, the, the full pension um, prior to commutation into a lump sum of part of the entitlement as a retiree. And it is important that everyone understands that also survivors must submit the proof of life in the form of the certificate of entitlement from the time that they become entitled, meaning from the year that they become entitled. What can you do to facilitate the establishment of a future potential survivor's benefit? As I said already, make sure you submit, you declare your spouse and your children, of course, to the fund in a timely manner before separation. In your case, that time has passed. You are separated already. Now make sure that you provide us with all the relevant documentation if it's not yet in file divorce documents, marriage documents, and so on. Um, then you can help pre-fill Form PENS E2. You can help your spouse, but don't date and sign the form yet, right? But just take the form, print it out, and show your spouse, you know, where they put their name, not the number, well, that, even that is fine, but um, in uh, ultimately that form shall not be submitted before you actually pass away and your surviving spouse is entitled to a benefit. But if you think it's helpful, you could go over the form with your spouse to make sure they understand what will be required in the future. At this time, right now, you can make sure that we have on file a copy of your marriage certificate, your birth certificates for yourself and your spouse, and um, official ID documents. Of course, they may not be valid anymore at the time that you actually pass away. So maybe that's less useful, but the marriage certificate and birth certificate for yourself and your spouse, of course, you could already submit if you wish to do that. Hmm. <laughs> 
I'm sorry. And please also inform your spouse that they have to submit that annual certificate of entitlement form so that they don't risk the suspension of their benefit. Now talking about, um, oh, I see there's a question about what if both the both spouses are entitled to survivor's benefits from the U. sorry, both spouses are entitled to retirement benefits from the UN Pension Fund. What happens? Indeed, that is actually not that unusual. If two spouses are entitled, they are married and they are entitled each to a retirement benefit from the pension fund, then if one of the spouses dies, the other one will receive a surviving spouse's benefit <laughs> plus their own retirement benefit. Hold on. I'm really sorry. Ooh. So I repeat, if there are two spouses entitled to a um, benefit from the pension fund, meaning a retirement benefit from the pension fund, then if one spouse dies, the other one is entitled to a surviving spouse's benefit plus their own retirement benefit. <laughs> I apologize, I'm going to take a cough thing. Hopefully that helps. Um, okay, I'm going to move on. I know my colleagues are moderating the Q&A. They will help respond to all of these questions. For children. So normally we pay a survivor's benefit to children if the child is under age 21 at the time that the retire, retiree passes away. So as long as the child is under age 21, we would pay that surviving child's benefit until the end of the month during which the child turns 21. <clears throat> if, however, the child was recognized as disabled by the UN Pension Fund, then we will pay beyond age 21 a surviving child's benefit. And by the way, <clears throat> way if there are several children entitled to survivor's benefits, um, we pay, of course, each of the children a surviving child's benefit for as long as they are entitled. And again, normally until the end of the month during which a child turns 21 years of age. Um, if a child, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is under the age of 16, we normally or we have to pay the child's benefit to a legal guardian. If the other parent is still alive, we will pay to that parent as a natural legal guardian. But if there is not another parent that is um, alive or someone else is the legal guardian for the child, then we would need legal guardianship documents for the legal guardian to be able to pay the child's benefit to that legal guardian. <clears throat> I'm really sorry for this. I hope this goes away slowly. OK, so make sure that if you have a disabled child that you have informed the fund, of course, and that is, of course, time sensitive. And second, if you have um, if there's a need to arrange for legal guardianship, maybe you already help with doing that so that following your death, there is a legal guardianship kind of system set up that can take over if you have children that cannot be paid directly. If a child is age 16 and over, we can pay the child directly, in which case it has to have its own bank account. And by the way, talking about bank account, it is important that anyone who is entitled to a survivor's benefit has a bank account in their name if they receive the benefit directly. So a spouse should have a bank account in their own name or if you have a joint account, the account must include the spouse's name so that they can receive the survivor's benefit into that account. And if a child is to be paid directly because they are 16 or older, then that child must have a bank account in their name. All right, so I'm moving on. Um, again, there are some guidance on what you could do now to prepare specifically for a disabled child. Um, make sure that you set up legal guardianship as early as possible. 
um, there is possibly a periodic review for the entitlement to a disabled child's benefit where we, our medical service, or rather our disability committee, needs to receive a medical documentation for a disabled child every few years to ensure or confirm that the entitlement to a disabled child's survivor's benefit continues in time. So these are just things to be aware of. And again, if we pay a child directly, we need to see receive a certificate of entitlement for that child. Um, <clears throat> Finally, we have a legal guardianship document and we have, of course, a legal guardianship booklet, I'm sorry, and we have um, the information about survivors that provides more detailed information about all of this. If a child was not approved for disabled child's benefit by the fund, then it is usually not possible to pay such benefit. I just want to highlight that because we have a few cases where we get re requests very, very late, years after separation. And in that case, it's very difficult, of course, to um, award that kind of benefit. All right, now we are going into the certificate of entitlement. There is a video about the certificate of entitlement, which I would encourage those of you who are not familiar with this exercise to watch because it contains important information. What is the certificate of entitlement? Why do we bother you with that every year? It is basically your proof of life that the fund must receive to ensure that you are still alive and we therefore have to continue paying you benefits. It's to protect the fund's financial security. If we had a lot of people who pass away and no one informs us, we may continue paying benefits um, and not suspend them and the benefits just continue in payment and we overpay and overpay and that of course will have an impact on the overall funding ratio of the fund. So it is important that the fund verifies that we pay benefits to those who are entitled for as long as they are entitled. <clears throat> so once you're in receipt of a regular monthly payment from the fund, you will be part of those who have to submit this annual proof of life, which we call the certificate of entitlement. If you don't submit it within the time frame required, we will have to suspend the payment of your monthly pension. After we receive what we need, an acceptable proof of life from you, we will reinstate the benefit. But it is, of course, painful for you to have your benefits stop and wait till we reinstate it. Therefore, Please make sure that every year you provide proof of life and you're at least in contact with the fund at least once a year. Normally, the proof of life in the form of the certificate of entitlement must be submitted to the fund at the latest by 31 December each year. You have different ways of submitting your proof of life. You can either use the digital certificate of entitlement that you can issue inside the digital certificate of entitlement app, where you just take a picture of yourself, a biometric picture, and once that has been taken and issued, you will have complied with this proof of life requirement and you need not do anything else. Or you can issue a paper CE, meaning we issue the CE, and you can use that paper-based CE form to date and hand sign it and then upload it back to the fund via your member self-service document upload or you send it by mail back to the fund. Again, we must receive either your DCE or your paper-based CE by 31 December every year. If we don't receive it by that date, then we will start what we call the pre-suspension process. We identify all the cases for which we did not receive the certificate of entitlement, and we then do an intensive follow-up helped by affix associations and helped by former member organizations. And we also reach out directly to all those where we have an email address on file and where we didn't receive a certificate of entitlement or any form of proof of life. And then we request to submit this document. If we receive it with the next couple of months, we will not suspend you. But if someone does not submit any form of acceptable proof of life to the fund, by the end of May, we will have to suspend that payment. 
And every year out of 80 plus thousand beneficiaries, we suspend around a thousand who did not comply with the proof of life requirement. Out of those thousand-ish, around one third probably passed away. Usually that's the ratio. The other two thirds simply didn't remember to submit the certificate of entitlement, um, are maybe in a care home in the meantime or something, or never received the certificate of entitlement. Um, there are various reasons. They forgot to inform us of a change of address, so we didn't, uh, we weren't able to send, or they never received the CE again. So my point here is, number one, it's good that you are aware of this annual requirement. Two, that you do everything you can to submit the certificate of entitlement in the form that you prefer, either digital or paper-based, to the fund by 31 December. And if for some reason you can use neither the digital certificate of entitlement nor the paper-based form, at least contact us by email or by phone so that we know you are there. In that case, we can then work with you to ensure that we receive what we need to not suspend your benefit. Um, the certificate of entitlement, again, you have time to submit it. The digital certificate of entitlement process can start on the 1st of January and you can submit it at any point between 1 January and 31 December. The paper-based CE we only publish in your member self-service and we send it out to everyone by mail in member self-service, only those not on the two-track. We do that every year, the paper-based CE we issue every year by the end of June. So it will reach you depending on where you live, somewhere between July, possibly August. And for those who have access to MSS, member self-service, you can access it if you're not on the two track as of 1st of July, usually. So the digital certificate of entitlement period is open from 1 January till 31 December. And any time in between, you can issue that digital certificate. You don't need to do it on the 1st of December. You can do it at any point in that period. And for those who prefer to use the paper-based form, CE form, you can access it in MSS as of 1 July. And then you have till year end to submit it to the fund in the way you prefer, or you receive it by mail if you don't access member self-service. And that can take, of course, a little while from 1 July until it reaches you. But again, please submit it by 31 December 2024. If you retired at the end of December 2024, you will have to submit a DCE only for 2025. And then you have the entirety of 25 to submit that DCE. Now about the certificate of entitlement and um, the mobile app. There is more information following, but just to highlight that you have a choice. No one is forced to use the digital certificate of entitlement and the mobile app. No one. We have the paper-based system that continues. We continue to mail out the paper CE to everyone who by June 2024 has not issued a digital CE. In other words, don't worry about it. If you don't want to use the DCE app, don't use it. But why we insist so much on it is because people who start using it usually actually like it. And yes, it takes a moment to set it up and register, but once you've done that, then it's fairly easy and there's no more mail, no more paper. You just simply use the DC app. But if you want, forget about the DC app. Don't feel forced to use it. Continue to use the paper-based CE form. That's absolutely fine. Um, and yeah, the bottom line is, one proof of life per year is enough, either the DCE or the CE form, whichever you prefer. This is the CE form. That's the document you receive by mail. 
And for those who are not on the two track, that's the document that you will be able to access inside your member self service under the document track do document tab as of 1 July 2024 and every year in July. That's a document that you should date and hand sign and then submit to the fund. If your signature has changed dramatically from the last time you submitted your CE, then you need to have it authenticated according to the usual authentication requirements in the gray field that you see underneath the signature and date. But if your signature is consistent year after year and pretty much the same, don't worry about signature authentication. Then we don't need it. Only if your signature has changed or if you can no longer sign, but you need to use a thumbprint. That happens. You know, sometimes people, because they have Parkinson or something, they tremble, they can't sign well anymore. No problem. Use a thumbprint. And in that case, we do need um, the authentication of your thumbprint by a medical, by a, by, by a doctor and a medical certificate to say, unfortunately, um, Christine can no longer hand sign because she has Parkinson's disease, but she did fix her thumbprint and I, the doctor, authenticate this here. So this is just a repeat of what I already said. Um, that's the other page of the Certificate of Entitlement where you have barcodes and so on. So it explains just what they are for. And um, this is what I just explained, that if in case of a medical situation, you cannot hand sign your CE as you did in the past, but you thumbprint it, then you need to submit together with the CE a medical certificate from the same doctor that also authenticates your thumbprint. More details provided on this page and explained on our website. If you didn't receive your CE form and you can't access it in any way, and you cannot use the Digital Certificate of Entitlement app, then please send us a letter, something with your handwritten signature and a date, and of course, your name and unique ID number in which you explain, I did not receive my CE, this is to confirm I'm alive, here is my letter. It's not as good as a CE, why? Because it doesn't have a barcode and only the barcode can automatically update our systems to tell us that you've complied with the CE requirement. But because we do a manual review of as part of the pre-suspension, we would see your letter and not suspend you if you send a letter in lieu of a CE. But ideally, we always want to receive your certificate of entitlement because that's the easiest way to update your records and ensure that you're not getting suspended. And what happens if for some reason you did get suspended because you didn't submit your CE. Contact us as soon as possible, either via the Contact Us page or at the specific mailbox, Payment Stopped. And in that case, we will need to receive from you proof of life. So ideally provide that as part of the uh, submission and we will reinstate you as soon as we can. It usually takes a good three weeks from receipt of your documents. Um, the other option is, as soon as possible, enroll in the Digital Certificate of Entitlement and issue your CE there because that will help reinstate you even faster. Oh, sorry, there was a mention of after-service health insurance. Indeed, if we are not paying you, there is no deduction for health insurance. So you would have to pay that retroactively, <coughs> excuse me, once we reinstate your benefit. and. Um, Another note is that if we don't receive a proof of life from you within two years from the date of suspension, we will have to forfeit your entitlement. Finally, as I mentioned, if you are using the paper-based CE, you can track whether the fund received it inside your MSS under the Documents tab as indicated here. Uh, sorry, not under the Documents tab. Under the Proof Documents tab, as indicated here, where we tell you whether we received and when we received your CE form for a given year. Now for the digital certificate of entitlement, the digital, the DCE. There's, there are some videos explaining what it is and how to register for the DCE on our website linked here. 
Um, <clears throat> this is a link to the page on the DCE. And just to sum up what the Digital Certificate of Entitlement app is, it's a mobile app that you can download on your device, either your phone or your tablet. It's optional. No one needs to use it. It's absolutely optional. It can be used by anyone, whether you are on the two track or not. Everyone can use the Digital Certificate of Entitlement app. You would have to first register. And once you have registered, you will have an interaction with the fund to confirm your identity. They will allow you, or basically they authorize the use of the DC app for you from that point onward. And then once that is the case, every year, year after year, you can simply take a picture and you will thus have provided your proof of life to the fund. If you submit your digital CE, you don't need to submit a paper-based CE form. And the digital CE can be submitted at any point between 1 January and 31 December 20, uh, of each year. Um, the app exists in English, French and Spanish. So you have three languages in which you can use the app. Um, once you enroll as part of the initial enrollment, once you have downloaded this app on your either Android or iPhone. You will have to go through a few steps to provide a phone number, an email address, um, your unique ID number. And you have to upload a valid picture ID document that includes your signature. Government picture ID document. Once that is the case, you submit this and then you will be contacted by the fund for an appointment to have a video call on the same device that you use to register. They will verify your identity. And once that is done, you're good. And sorry, I forgot one step. As part of the initial setting up your digital CE app, you also take a picture. So the steps of setting up the app is you provide phone number, email address, unique ID, and of course your name. And then <coughs> upload, a, <coughs> excuse me, photo ID document. And then you take a picture, a biometric picture. And then once that is done, you move to the step of waiting to be contacted by the fund for an appointment for verification of identity. Once you have had that call, you're being authorized to use the app. And as of then, you can issue year after year the digital CE inside the app. No need to re-enroll at any point. OK, if you change your device in the future, you may have to reset up the app on the new device and have a quick email exchange with the fund um, just to confirm that, but that's it. Mm. Often we get questions, is the biometric data safe? Yes, it's only stored on your phone. It's not stored in any records of the fund or other. And there is a lot of material on our website about the digital CE. So you can go there and um, take your time, read the FAQs, read the step-by-step -step guides, because really, they have been built over time and improved <clears throat> to help you with this process, process of enrolling and then issuing your annual CE. As I mentioned, we have now over 30,000 beneficiaries using this digital CE um, year after year. Now we are looking quickly at what happens if you need to change your bank account or address. So we're leaving behind the certificate of entitlement and proof of life requirement and we look at what if you needed to change your address or bank details. So we have a form called PF23M to change address and a form called PF23 to change banking instructions. If you only want to change your address, again, remember, if you are user of MSS and not on the two track, you can actually change your address inside member self-service under the address tab. You don't need to use a form. However, if you are not a user of MSS or you are, but you're on the two track, then you need to use form PF23M to inform the fund of a change in address. Once we receive the form, we will implement the change. You can upload that form inside your member self-service under document upload, or you can send it to us by mail. If you also need to change your banking instructions, then use form PF23 
where you provide us with your new banking instruction or change currency, whatever the case may be. So this is what you can do. Make sure you sign the document and you date it and you hand sign it, of course, um, before uploading a scanned version inside Member Self Service. These are the forms in case you need to use the form. Keep in mind, for well, form PF23, if you change your bank details, um, <clears throat> Even if you change bank account inside the same country, we need to know, right? Every time one digit of your bank account changes or you change banks, the fund will need to know to make sure you get your money. If it is required, provide the sort of SWIFT codes. And also if they change, let the fund know because we may not be aware that a SWIFT code change, in which case it could imp impede the payment of your benefit. And then once we receive your documents, it takes um, basically around 15 business days between receipt of the document to implement the change. Now, if that is somewhere in the payroll cycle, then um, it could take more than one payroll. So what does this mean? If we close the payroll around the nine or tens of the months, that means we're issuing that payment by the end of March uh, of, of the same month. So 9 March would be paid at 31 March. So payroll closes 9 March, we pay at the 31st March, right? So if we receive your document, <coughs> excuse me, later than payroll closure, there's nothing we can do except we cannot issue the payment. If you if you tell us, you can say, don't issue the payment, I give you new instructions, and then I get retroactive payments in the future. Otherwise, we pay into your old account and only with the next cycle into your new account. So basically, don't close an old account until you have received your new in your payment into the new account once we have implemented the change in payment instructions. Okay, that's the best way to ensure you're not missing out on a payment. Now for cost of living, <clears throat> excuse me, cost of living adjustment. UN pension benefits, you know this, are adjusted every year, sometimes even twice a year. That's rare, but it could happen. So cost of living adjustment or COLA happens um, regularly. It's based on our pension adjustment system. We have regulations and rules around this, and it happens for both People, for both the payments under the dollar track or those who are on the two track or local track. So basically for the details, you would have to go to the pension adjustment system. There's a lot of information about it, but the system is that we will adjust based on the movements of the consumer price index, normally of the United States for the US dollar track and if you are on the two-track system, then we are looking at the consumer price index movements of your country of residence, and we call that the local track, and would then take that into account for adjustments. I think very early on, I showed you Austria, and you saw it had a different adjustment than the United States. So anyone on the two-track for Austria would have benefited from a different adjustment than those um, on the US dollar track um, who would have gotten the two the, sorry the adjustment for the United States? Normally, we adjust benefits once a year, and that is provided that the consumer price index relevant consumer price index either for the U.S. dollar track or the two track local track has moved by at least two percent. <clears throat> excuse me, since the date of the last adjustment. If that is the case, we will apply whatever adjustment has to be applied. If it is not the case, if the adjustment or if the movement has been less than 2% since the last adjustment, then that CPI movement will be carried over and applied the following year and combined with whatever additional adjustment might have happened in the meantime. Normally, these adjustments are effective 1 April every year. Um, in high inflation situations where a consumer price index has moved by 10% or more than the last from the last adjustment, we would adjust again in October. 
But you see, it really requires a very, very substantial um, movement of the consumer price index of 10% or more, very rare. But if that is the case, then yes, we would do an adjustment in April and then again in October. I already mentioned we had a 3.4 adjustment upward for the US dollar track payments, which is over 80% of our payments are on the US dollar track. And of course, we also adjusted the local track payments for those on the two track, which are around 17% of our beneficiaries who receive payments under the two track system. Um, when that happens, we issue cost of living adjustment letters and those quota letters are posted in your member self service. This is for the two track. So if you're on the two track and there was an adjustment, we will post this as a cola letter inside the document tab of your member self service. I think that sometimes we also refer to these cola letters as quarterly statements, but it's the same thing basically. And finally, again, if you have member self service, I would encourage you to check it regularly because these documents will be posted, as I said, under the documents tab. And it is important that you're aware of what is happening with your benefit because it explains also fluctuations, positive or negative, of course. And finally, the UN Pension Fund Emergency Fund. To understand um, what this emergency fund is, there is um, a video, emergency fund video, and we have a booklet about the emergency fund. I definitely suggest that if you are experiencing severe financial hardship and you want to make an application for a one-time payment from the UN Pension Fund as part of the emergency fund, then please first read the booklet and watch the video. Why? Because there are only very specific conditions under which the fund is allowed to make emergency fund payments. We have a budget every year of around, um, I think right now it's $125,000 that we can pay as emergency fund payments. However, because of course it is money of the pension fund and therefore of its membership, we cannot just give it out to anyone at any time. We have very specific conditions under something called Note A of the fund's regulations and rules where it is stipulated under what circumstances a fund, the fund may make a payment from the emergency fund. First of all, emergency fund payments can only be made to someone in receipt of a regular monthly payment from the fund or to help with funeral cost for a deceased retiree or beneficiary. It could also be used to help with funeral cost of to help a retiree with funeral costs of a spouse. Um, so funeral cost is one of the situations where we may be able to provide you with a fixed amount that is set every year for aid with funeral cost. Number one. Number two, we can help with medical cost where these medical costs were not covered by your health insurance. In that case, we have to receive proof of what was paid by your health insurance and what was not paid to then determine what the fund can help with. If you don't have medical insurance, then also, of course, we may be able to help, um, but you have to provide um, information that you're not covered by health insurance after service health insurance. And we would be able to only pay a percentage towards what you need to pay. Um, Another situation where we may be able to help is under um, special emergency situations due to natural disasters. For example, if there is severe flooding, earthquake, um, hurricanes, if these have destroyed your home and you have experienced, of course, financial hardship because of such event, then we may be able to provide you with a one-time payment. And usually that payment is a fixed amount. I think currently it's around $500 and that's it. So we are not talking about huge amounts that the fund can help with, but for funeral costs, help with medical expenses and um, under special natural disaster emergency situations, 
we can help with a little bit. Emergency fund payments are one-time payments. They are not repeat payments. So that's important to remember. They are not meant to substitute pension. So if you say, I don't receive every month, I don't receive enough money, give me a bit more every month, that's not possible. They are, the emergency fund is also not intended to help with educational costs for children, to help to, I don't know, refurnish a home. All of that is not possible. So it's really very specific and I would really invite anyone potentially interested in making an application to check the booklet and make sure that you are aware of the conditions. If you do want to make a submission, a request for emergency fund assistance, then please provide that request so together with proof of payment made for, final, for a funeral cost and for medical expenses. And then based on proof of payment made, the fund will assess whether you qualify for emergency fund assistance. We have a certain formula that we use to see based on length of contributory service, benefit amount that someone is entitled to, age, well age actually no longer, but also what kind of benefit you're entitled to. So we look at all these factors to determine whether or not we can make an emergency fund payment. We would love to pay everyone, but we have a limited amount and we have over 86,000 members in receipt of periodic benefits. So we have to manage that money carefully. All right, but absolutely, if you think you qualify, please reach out so that we can assess your case and let you know if you qualify, if we need additional information, and finally, of course, if we can make a payment, what the amount will be. I just want to highlight it's never huge amounts. Um, there is also, by the way, an emergency fund request tab in your member self service that you could also use. But in that case, you still need to submit hard copy documents to the fund or upload them in member self service to make to provide proof of payment made and this element of proof of payment made is really important for funeral costs and medical um, expenses we don't make advance payments we assess what you had to pay and whether we can help you with a little bit towards such payment for the special emergency fund assistance in the context of natural disaster it's a bit different there if someone qualifies we make a one-time payment and finally, because we have received requests in the recent past for whether we can help with financial assistance from the emergency fund in the context of conflict and war, we cannot. Those are not covered under our provisions. And I think if they were, we would probably exhaust our funds very, very quickly, sadly, but we cannot help from the emergency fund in those circumstances. That's the view in member self service if you wanted to make a submission. And before we close, how can you contact the UN Pension Fund? I showed that to you at the very beginning. I just want to highlight it one more time so that you know there is a contact us tab on our web page. Please use it to contact us, but also to see the different kinds of contact channels we have and that you should please use. To send a message, please use this form on the contact us page, as I explained earlier. And if you need to call us, then you have the numbers provided either for New York or Geneva. It's just by time zone um, or toll free numbers. Again, the contact center functions 24 hours a day. So we cover 24 hours a day, regardless which number you call New York, Geneva or a toll free number. Monday to Friday, you will normally reach someone because we cover 24 hours. And of course, as I already mentioned, you can always visit us. I know, unfortunately, we are only in New York and Geneva for walk-in services. We have very, very small liaison offices in Bangkok and Nairobi with two people in each office, and they are mostly in charge of doing outreach in the region. Um, but they do offer um, to meet with people. So if you want, you can locally reach out. If you are in Bangkok or Nairobi, then please 
see if you can reach out, and I'm sure you can, to connect with them and they could probably meet with you in person if you would like to. But regular walk-in services are possible only in New York and Geneva, as I said, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And finally, I did highlight already, but I think it's just important to remind you, for payment stopped or reporting the death of a retiree or beneficiary, we have the urgent assistant page with specific mailboxes where you can write directly. Info available in six languages so that those who don't speak English or French um, fluently or at all could also understand what is required. So these are specific mail addresses where you could directly address your queries instead of using the contact form. Generally, it's always best to use the contact form. And honestly, it's the same because we give priority to these items, regardless of whether you write directly to the mailbox or you use the contact form. But if you need to request your unique ID number or need help with member self-service support, write to these respective mailbox addresses or use the contact form. Our member self-service support team will respond within one day. If you need to reach out because of a stop payment or to report the death of a pension fund member, then you have these two third and fourth mailboxes and please use those. Again, they are handled as priority. But I will say that that requires more in-depth review and analysis of a case, so it takes a little bit longer to respond to this. Yet we do endeavor to reply within maximum five days or faster. Um, and that is it. So for I close, first I would like to thank you for all your attention. I hope we covered aspects of retirement and receiving benefits that are relevant to you and that were helpful. I'm sure there are some that should or that you would have liked to hear about that weren't in here. Mm -hmm. I will include in the presentation that I post on the website information about retirees who return to active service. I'm not covering this here because it is actually quite long to cover and within two hours and 15 minutes it would have been very hard. I know we announced that we would cover this here, but I'm going to include the pages the slides, let's say, about um, retirees who return to active service after retirement and again work for a UN pension fund member organization so that you have the information. The recording and these slides will be posted on our website under the um, pension town hall session page. Just one moment, sorry. Let me just remind you under this, under resources, let me go to the homepage. So if you go up here, menu under resources, pension town hall sessions, this is where we are going to post the event of today, 22 May. And you will see the link to the recording and to the PowerPoint, which will include additional slides about employment after retirement, um, that will be posted here within the next two days, I hope. I would say by the end of this week. Um, and then, of course, you have information about future sessions, namely the Fre French session of this topic in on 12 June. And then thereafter, we will have other sessions um, that start again in July or that start, that continue in July um, that you will post, see posted here. Um, finally, I don't know whether the survey was already posted, but if not, I would invite Mirko to please post the survey link um, so that you could please, those of you who are willing to do that, take a very brief survey to give us feedback on this session so that we know whether it was useful. And if we should make adjustments, changes, um, whatever it is that you would like to suggest, these sessions are built for you. And our aim is to make it as useful as possible to as many of you as possible. So your feedback is truly valued. And if you take the time, it takes about two minutes or three minutes to complete the survey, I would be very grateful. So again, I don't know if Mirko, if you already posted it, maybe you can post it one more time. Um, thank you for those who are willing to take the survey. So with this, 
big thank you to everyone for attending and a huge thank you to my colleagues who moderated over 120 questions. I hope you got the answers you needed. I know it's never enough, but at least I hope it was useful in what we covered today. Um, and big thanks to our organizers, also the IT team, Alessandro and Marino, and of course to um, you all for being here. Finally, I wish you all good health and a very long and hopefully happy retirement and also to our beneficiaries, all the very best to everyone. I hope it was a good session. Thank you. <laughs>